So we're very pleased at the Institute uh, to have Jeremy Brown, um, who is the special representative uh, of the City of London to the EU. Now, I'm sure everybody in this room knows that the City of London is not the same as London. And uh, it gets even more complicated than that because uh, it also represents now the interests of the financial services centre, whether they're in the city of the square mile or down the river or even elsewhere in the UK. Uh, but we all know the importance of that industry to them uh, and to us. And uh, Jeremy uh, has been in several European countries already. Uh, now he's he, delighted to see him here. He's um, been to the Taoiseach's office this morning and um, visited uh, many of the leading organizations. So we're delighted that he's come to the Institute. Um, and um, I noticed my friend and colleague Richard Curran in the Irish Independent this morning, and I commend you all to buy the hard copy and pay some real money. <laughs> But anyway, his, his, his message is Canary Wharf on the Liffey, I don't think so. But obviously, um, while there's going to be no schadenfreude about this, um, people do like to look for a silver lining in Brexit that we might get some of Canary Wharf uh, on the Liffey. But at the same time, everybody is aware of the risks and dangers of this whole process uh, to Europe, to Britain, and, and to Ireland, so uh, I look forward very much to hearing what Jeremy has to say. Uh, he was the Liberal Democrat MP for Taunton Dean from 2005 to 2015, and in that time held several positions, opposition whip from 2006 to 2007, shadow minister for home affairs in 2007, shadow minister of the treasury 2007 to 10, and then in the coalition government he was a Foreign Office Minister uh, to 2012 and Home Office Minister 2012 to 2013. I am called the City of London's Special Representative to the EU. And when I took this post a year ago, um, it was originally envisaged that I would be called the Ambassador to the EU, but this was checked with the British Foreign Office. And they said, oh, this is going to be a little bit difficult because the Queen appoints ambassadors and... Mr. Brown may have many merits, but he hasn't been appointed by the Queen. You'll have to come up with uh, another title. So it was then suggested I'd be the envoy to the EU. And the Foreign Office said, hmm, this might be a little bit difficult because normally the British Prime Minister appoints envoys, and Mr. Brown may have many merits, but he hasn't been appointed by the Prime Minister. So I said, well, that's fine. I don't mind that much what the title is. What are they suggesting instead? And they said, we'd like him to be the special representative, which... Not only sounds a lot grander in my view than the other two, but sounds like I've been appointed by the United Nations, which, uh, which is not true, or at least not yet. But I started this role, um, so as was said, my background is in, in politics, um, not in financial services. But I started this role uh, just over a year ago, so well before the referendum took place in Britain. Um, and the basis of my appointment was that the City of London is a global financial centre. It's certainly Europe's global financial centre. And just as we communicated as a matter of course with interested parties in the United Kingdom, government, think tanks, media and others, uh, given that we were a pan-European centre, we ought to be doing that as a matter of course with those audiences across the other 27 member states and with the institutions of uh, the EU in Brussels uh, and Strasbourg. And we were doing that but not perhaps in a sustained and systematic way. And so I was uh, brought in to uh, add extra capacity and momentum in that regard. And I travelled frequently and I talked about capital markets union and digital single market and other single market developments and developments in the Eurozone and banking union and so on and so forth, all of which remain of interest and significance to people in London, but on the 23rd of June, or the early hours of the 24th of June, were shunted rather dramatically, I think it's fair to say, to one side. And since then, I've talked about almost one subject to the exclusion of all others, and that is Brexit and the implications of Brexit for the City of London, and for Britain, and for the other 27 countries in the EU, of which Ireland is 
interesting and unique because the nature of Britain's relationship with Ireland means that there are factors that are under consideration here which do not apply in the same way or apply at all in some cases uh, in other member states. <coughs> and I've been traveling widely, so last week I was in Finland and Sweden, the week before that I was in Poland and Hungary, and on it goes, getting a sense of how people see this issue, where the pressure points are, where the tensions are, um, and what we can do to try and navigate a course through the negotiations which uh, are not uh, excessively harmful to the City of London, uh, but I'd say by extension uh, harmful to the wider uh, economic interests of the other 27 member states of the EU and business corporate interests across the EU, and ultimately the individual private citizens uh, of the EU uh, as well. Now, um, I am going to uh, go a little bit further than I would feel able to do if I was a minister in the British government, because the British government doesn't really have a position at the moment. And if I don't make some assumptions, uh, we won't have a very fruitful and productive uh, uh, conversation this afternoon. So let me make a little, a, a few sort of working assumptions uh, in terms of trying to think how this may play out. <clears throat> it seems to me the British government has um, uh, got a duty to discharge the mandate that was given to it by the British electorate. Sometimes people say to me, is that really going to happen, that Brexit? Certainly most people in the city of London, not everybody, but most people, most businesses wanted Britain to remain in the EU, uh, voted that way, in some cases campaigned uh, that way as well. Um, so most people in the city of London didn't want this outcome. And most people in the city of London, if they had the choice, would uh, seek to have a conclusion to the negotiations which was as minimalist and as non-disruptive as possible in terms of the future relationship with the EU looking as closely as it could to the previous relationship when Britain was a fully-fledged member of the EU. Now, that is fine up to a point, but I think there is a danger of the City of London having a parallel conversation with the British government, because the British government uh, obviously needs to take the concerns and interests of the City of London seriously. We have a strategic importance to the United Kingdom economy. Um, but we are one concern of many. We're not the only concern the British government faces. Uh, and the British government has to operate within the context of the politics of the United Kingdom uh, and be sensitive to those uh, considerations. So let me go through a few of the um, uh, assumptions. One of them is on timing. Uh, this comes up frequently as a, as a conversation and will be put out of our misery in due course and everyone will get a broader sense of what the timing is. Um, but people sometimes say, well, one of the factors you'll have to consider is the German election and the French election and the Dutch election. I was talking to a British parliamentarian last week and he said, shall I tell you what election I think the British Prime Minister will be most interested in taking into account? The British election. And we are due to have a general election, uh, unless it happens earlier, in May 2020. And I think it would be very difficult for the government to explain to the British public why we are still in the EU in May 2020, four years after the British public voted by a narrow but significant margin to leave the EU. I think it would be quite difficult for the British government to explain why people are being invited in June 2019 to vote for their new MEP three years after we've voted as a country to leave the EU as well. And there is a natural EU cycle with the Commission and others coming to a conclusion at that point. So I think if you work backwards, there is some logic. I have no insights to this, I'm just making observations. There is some logic in trying to bring the process to a conclusion in the early to middle part of 2019, and that would mean that if you had a two-year timetable, you'd need to activate it in the early to middle part of 2017. I think also if you work forward, um, there is pressure on the British government to reveal its hand in the reasonably soon sort of medium term. I think people understand we have a new prime minister in Britain. We have new structures of government in Britain. This is a very big, complex negotiation. People don't expect uh, Britain to reveal its hand overnight. Uh, but I think there's probably some political pressure internally in Britain for the British government not to stall. I think it would look odd for a lot of British audiences if we got to June 
2017, a year after the referendum, the negotiations hadn't even begun. A lot of people would feel that that was excessively slow. Uh, I think there's some pressure in some quarters in the European Union for Britain to get on with it. This is seen as a distraction. It's hanging over the EU. Um, and people would like to see it resolved, or at least the process of resolving it beginning. Uh, and I think there's an important business imperative, and you hear this in the City of London to some extent, where people recognise that um, uh, the government's going to take some time, but there is a danger that the political process lags behind the business process and the business decisions that are taking place. If you get to the point where people start sort of breaking ranks and making location decisions as businesses, because they are getting frustrated about waiting for the British government to actually get the show on the road, then the British government has to some extent slightly lost control of the process. And I think the British government would almost certainly be well advised to bear that in mind when it thinks about the timing. So all of those suggest to me that uh, we may even get an indication when our new Prime Minister makes her speech to the Conservative conference next week about some indicators on timing and the broad outlines. Maybe we will, maybe we won't. Um, but the this is a process that is lasting months, not years, before we start the negotiations. And maybe um, by the turn of the year, early into next year, we will have a better sense of where um, we are seeking to go. <coughs> then it's the question for the British government about what are the outlines or the toughest sticking points. <coughs> now, freedom of movement of people is not a problem for the City of London because we are a global financial centre. Uh, we're not really a British centre, we're a global centre that's in Britain. Uh, and we have banks and other financial services institutions from all over the world, certainly from uh, all over the rest of Europe, but further afield than that. And we have people working right up to the very most senior levels from across Europe and across the wider world as well. So immigration is not a psychological problem or indeed a practical problem for the City of London, although, of course, the British government might say with some justification that the City of London sees the benefits of immigration and doesn't have to manage some of the uh, harder consequences and they'd probably have a fair point. But the reason I'm touching upon this is it's not a sticking point for the City of London or uh, our commercial interests. <clears throat> but the British government, I think, would struggle, even if it wanted to, to interpret the referendum result as a mandate for untrammeled continued freedom of movement between the rest of the EU and the UK. Uh, you can look at that referendum that we had in 23rd of June many ways, but it's hard to argue that that wasn't a factor in the debate. Um, and we have some practical considerations. A lot of countries I go to in Eastern and Southern Europe, their public policy debate is around population shrinkage. And they have birth replacement rates, even in countries which feels slightly counterintuitive, like Italy, where their birth rate is something like, I can't remember exactly, but you know, 1.3, 1.4. You need 2.1 to replace population with no immigration. <clears throat> so they are <clears throat> wrestling with aging population and declining population issues. Whereas Britain's population increased by 500,000 last year, um, 350,000 net immigration. Uh, so we are putting on more than a Republic of Ireland a decade at current rates. <clears throat> And uh, I think there are some public policy issues. I, my uh, guess is the British Prime Minister believes this to be a real issue, not a sort of confected issue uh, around cultural change, but also around, um, around numbers and practical considerations. So I think the British government will want to um, uh, assert itself in this area. And I think it will also uh, have difficulty selling to the British public that we, the United Kingdom, should carry on making the same budget contribution to the EU as a non-member than we did when we were a member of the EU. I think for most citizens, especially when budgets are tight and other areas of public spending are being squeezed, it is a counterintuitive message that you cease to be a member of a club but you carry on paying the membership fee. <clears throat> now the problem with both of those areas is that um, they are sticking points for a lot of people elsewhere in the European Union. And a lot of people say, and if you believe them, uh, and I'm talking a lot of people up to you know, uh, Angela Merkel and Francois Hollande, not, not any old people, the people in positions of power and responsibility, that it is not possible for Britain to be in the single market 
unless it observes the so-called four freedoms, of which freedom of movement is one, <clears throat> and unless it pays a substantial amount into the EU budget. <clears throat> and here is where you get the sort of economics and the politics getting out of sync with each other, because it is clearly in the interests of both Britain and the EU27 that there is as much access in both directions in trade uh, and single market issues as possible. And this is more keenly felt in Ireland than it is in any of the other members of the EU27. Ireland does more trade, as you would expect, with Britain than it does with any other country in Europe. Um, the British Isles, including Ireland, is in many ways a single economic entity uh, in terms of supply chain management of businesses. They have a single business model in some cases. They're not separating out the Irish part of their operations. And of course, we have a historical agreement on movement of people, which means quite often people across Europe say, how come those Irish people got to vote in your referendum and none of the rest of us got to vote on it? Because our franchise was the same as the general election, not the European or local elections, so it was limited to people eligible to vote in the general election, but that obviously included Irish citizens, but not French, German, or any other Europeans. So there are particular Irish considerations in terms of trying to make sure that we have as least disruptive outcome as possible in commercial terms to this um, separation that is going to take place. And I view this, this is uh, possibly a rather crude way of looking at it, but I, why not try and strip it down to the basics? I see a sort of spectrum where on one end we have people in this debate uh, in the EU whose principal motivation is political and whose response to the referendum result was highly emotional. And you have people on the other end of the scale whose principal consideration is economic and whose response to the referendum result was primarily pragmatic. And if I could, the reason I say that, it's a rather sort of, you could argue, a slightly divisive way of describing the dynamic, is that if you go to Brussels, um, particularly if you speak to people who work within the institutions of the EU, the Commission, the Parliament, uh, and some countries within the EU where this view is more prevalent, France or Luxembourg perhaps, um, the primary consideration is how can we keep the EU27 together as cohesively as possible, and in many cases integrate it further, have a greater degree of harmonisation. And uh, they see Brexit through the prism of a threat to the institutional integrity of the EU. They worry about countries that look to Britain perhaps for leadership or look at Britain's example, um, perhaps Denmark or Sweden are countries that are, if you like, quite influenced by Britain and see things in similar ways to Britain. And they think we need to disincentivize those countries from going down Britain's path. And even more, they look at disruptive political forces within their own countries and worry about giving succor to those disruptive forces. So for all of those reasons, they say we must not allow Britain to leave the EU and to be seen to have succeeded as a result of leaving the EU. Uh, and we, as a consequence of that, need to try and inflict some consequences, some, I'd even go so far as to say some you know, economic downsides on Britain to demonstrate to a wider audience the folly of leaving the great European project. Now, there are people on the other end of the scale, and they include some people, some countries. So, for example, uh, Poland or Hungary uh, aggressively chafe <laughs> against European integration, um, are very vocal in arguing against a more integrationist agenda. Their vision for the European Union is nation states working closely in alliance, not an amalgamation of nation states into something approximating a super state. Made a conscious point of delaying their membership, possibly indefinitely, of the Eurozone for that reason. But it's also a view that is held much more widely in the private sector, as you would imagine, than it is in the political realm. And that argument is that this uh, willful political desire to inflict harm on Britain uh, will be mutually destructive. Uh, that this will end up being like a divorce where uh, 
uh, both parties to the divorce are willing to uh, damage their own material interests in order to uh, inflict harm on their former spouse. And that, that may be an uh, uh, understandable emotional response, but it's not a rational and logical uh, response to the predicament in which we find ourselves. And I say that because I think it's very important, particularly with regards to the Irish viewpoint, that we try and encourage the conversation as much as possible into the realm of the economic and the pragmatic. Now, you could say, well, you know, this was Britain's problem because Britain voted to leave. No one forced Britain to leave, and Britain needs to live with the consequences of its decision. But uh, there is danger, I think, in going down that path. There's actually danger about what it says about the EU, I think, to some extent, that if coercion becomes the primary tool by which the EU seeks to hold its membership together, uh, then quite a lot of people may slightly come to reassess the nature of the club. But also, I think if an institution puts its own well-being ahead of that of the citizens that it purports to serve, then again, the institution is going down a difficult path as well. And why does this matter from the sort of point of view of the City of London? Is because, and I can't really make this argument without sounding rather sort of self-serving, but the City of London is overwhelmingly the dominant financial centre in Europe. It is Europe's only global financial centre. London's peer group is not Frankfurt or Luxembourg. London's peer group is New York and Singapore. We are the financial centre for the middle part of the world in global terms. And there are advantages to Europe in having a global financial centre on our continent. We had a state visit from the uh, president of China a year ago to Britain. He spent the first night having dinner as a guest of the Queen at Buckingham Palace. So he was interested in interacting, if you like, with the British state in all its manifestations. And they're all, you know, prime minister and the generals and all of the people you would imagine be invited to an event of that sort. And on the second night, he was a guest of the Lord Mayor of London in the Guildhall, the building that Audrey and I work in, um, for a banquet, because the, prime, the Chinese Premier, Chinese President rather, was interacting with the City of London. And if you take a sort of step back from Europe and you look at Europe's, what Europe does well, if you like, one of the ideas, ironically, behind the European Union, beyond a sort of general sense of post-war reconciliation, is that these small to medium-sized nation states in global terms could, by aggregating their endeavours and their expertise and their knowledge, be more than the sum of their parts and count for something in global terms. And arguably, and this is the irony, arguably the best example of that happening in practice, I and mean, in some areas of scientific research and others, but arguably the best example is the City of London, which is a financial centre of global standing arguably the financial centre in the world, in a continent where we have 7% of the world's population that's shrinking and we have about a fifth of the world's economy in it shrinking, we have a growing international hub for finance in London. And the reason I say it's an irony, of course, is that um, it is hosted by a country that has, in effect, rejected the integrationist argument. Um, and yet the people who make the integrationist argument most strongly are those who are most in favour of trying to disintegrate the City of London as a financial centre. And why is that uh, a perilous path to go down? This is the, in a way, the bit that sounds self-serving, but I don't believe it is. Is that this big centre exists for a reason. It is a, it responds to demand. There's sometimes, I think, a slightly deterministic view in Brussels that uh, the City of London exists where it does because a committee of the EU decided it would and that nearly everything that happens across the EU is sort of allocated from the centre. But actually London has grown over hundreds of years and evolved into the centre that it is today, organically, through a whole millions of people and thousands of businesses taking decisions about their commercial interests. And if you take a corporation from somewhere in southern Europe, for example, yeah, they are going to London to issue bonds or borrow money because the scale of, of London and the expertise in London makes it advantageous for them to do so. They're not being forced to do that. 
They're doing it because they realize they get the best rates, the most people are willing to buy their bonds. If they're trying to invest the pension savings of their employees, they go to London because the expertise uh, and the opportunities and the rates are better than they find elsewhere on the continent. If they're trying to exchange currencies, they go to London because the pool of, uh, of uh, money available for that and the expertise is greater than anywhere else on the continent. So trying to diminish and disaggregate our global financial centre uh, isn't just about allocating jobs across Europe. It's about a willful act of self-harm being perpetrated by the people and states of Europe upon themselves. And I don't doubt that um, many people would rather that the Global Financial Centre for Europe was in the EU than in Europe but not in the EU. But it actually, most of the time, for most businesses, doesn't matter very much. It just matters that it's on the continent of Europe. And I think there is some opportunity, depending on the outcome of the negotiations, um, uh, for Dublin to attract some business activity from London. But I think, by and large, Dublin's interests are complementary to those of London, not hostile or competitive to those of London. I think Dublin benefits from being in close proximity to a global financial centre. And if we end up with, for the sake of argument, a thousand jobs leaving London, just an illustrative number. First of all, I don't think all thousand will go to somewhere in the EU. Uh, there isn't like a total sum of financial services jobs in Europe and the only conversation to be had is where they are located. Uh, we are competing in a global market some of these businesses will say, well, we're essentially an American business. We'll bring some of those jobs back to America. Or the growth rates in Europe are so low compared to the growth rates in some Asian economies that we will concentrate more of our firepower and attention on Asian markets. Or the scale of doing this type of activity makes it just about viable and profitable in London, but it doesn't make it viable and profitable if we do it on a smaller scale in lots of different centres. So we'll just stop having those jobs altogether. So I think it's quite possible, let's say 1,000 jobs, this is all illustrative, but let's say 1,000 jobs leave London, that 400 of them do not go to the rest of the EU. So we're now down to 600. Let's say 100 go to Dublin, 100 go to Frankfurt, 100 go to Paris, 100 go to Madrid, 100 go to Amsterdam, and 100 go to Milan. The problem you then have is, of course, that is to the narrow advantage of each of those cities, because they have 100 more people paying taxes than they previously did. The problem is that you are disaggregating the services. Not only do you have less money available, you don't also have the connectivity that comes from having this activity aggregated in a single centre. So the danger you have is that people will spend <coughs> a lot of their time flying back to London to meet their customers and their advisors because there is a reason why business congregates in one area and it's not determined by government, it's determined by the interests of those businesses. So where does that leave us all? I suppose what it leaves us with is a very difficult political conundrum because it seems to me hard for the British government to deliver the softest form of Brexit, consistent with the mandate it has been delivered by the um, British people. Um, it seems to me uh, intelligent for the British government to try and deliver the softest form it can of a sort of harder end of Brexit, if you like, sort of beyond the sort of EEA Norway option, that there is a particular British option that is tailor-made to suit the uniqueness of our circumstances, um, but that it, is, uh, that it is engineered to try and be as economically mutually beneficial uh, as possible, uh, and that we, as a result of that, uh, can ride the uh, Brexit wave with... Uh, minimal disruption to the economy of Ireland and the economy of the wider EU 27 as well as to that of Britain. But it is clearly a, a fraught process. Uh, it causes a lot of anxiety uh, in the City of London and it will be the principal subject which will be talked about uh, for many years to come. And uh, I look forward to talking about it more with you in the next half hour or so. Thank you.